I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime, and this is Currents. Wounded warriors take on a new mission. For a lot of these guys, it's their first trip out of the hospital. It really helps them to see that life will go on and that they're going to be able to do a lot of the things that they thought they'd probably never be able to do again. Arizona's immigration law takes effect next week, but this week we go into the deep to talk about it. Every person needs to have some status in the society. Now, unfortunately, many of these people came here without any status. Plus, beginning a new life. A family in Cuba prepares to start over in Spain. Well, good evening and thank you so much for joining us this Friday. Earlier this month, Pope Benedict issued another plea for an end to violence in Iraq, urging that country's leadership to help protect Christians in a country still being torn apart by bloodshed. All this as the Congress in this country is poised to approve more funding for the wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan. That funding that could make the total cost for those conflicts over one trillion dollars. But of course there is another cost as well in lives that have been changed forever by war. Well that's what prompted Benny to take part in this weekend's soldier ride in New York. It was sponsored by the Wounded Warrior Project and as Ingrid Rojas reports it drew dozens of veterans to Midtown Manhattan to begin a three-day bicycle trip, a journey of resilience and hope. I'm gonna be riding one of these uh, these three-wheeled bikes right here. It's actually quite comfortable and uh, very easy to do. So if you've ever ridden a bike before, this will be really easy. <laughs> Specialist Lyle Joseph Yance, a 21-year-old from Missouri, lost his right leg after a remote control explosion this past June in Afghanistan. It's all good now. I'm, I'm recovering well. I'm getting ready to get fitted for a prosthetic. So I'll be, be rocking and rolling here soon. Lyle's injury is so severe that he will not return to active duty and he is just one of the 18,000 returning severely injured veterans from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan for whom life will never be the same. The soldier ride organized by the Wounded Warrior Project is a way to bring awareness to their difficulties. For a lot of these guys it's their first trip out of the hospital, out of Walter Reed or Bethesda and uh, it really helps them to see that life will go on and that they're going to be able to do a lot of the things that they thought they'd probably never be able to do again. The three-day ride kicked off from Macy's in Midtown Manhattan with a breakfast reception. Our mission is really captured in our logo. And if you take a look at our logo, it depicts one warrior carrying another from the field of battle. And that is, at some level, really what we're about. It's about warriors supporting each other. It's about you guys supporting each other through your recovery. But what we've learned over time is it takes more than just one warrior supporting another. It really takes a whole community of support. And this is a phenomenal program. They get to uh, see how welcoming the community is. And also it allows them to go out, not as an individual, but as, as a team of injured service members to go out and experience something new together. The Wounded Warrior Project is a great organization to help us get through our recovery easier than what we normally would go through it alone. As the breakfast concluded, Eriberto and the other riders took to their bikes, accompanied by the music of the NYPD marching band. It's important to support wounded warriors because they really sacrifice their, their, their bodies uh, and their lives and their well-beings on behalf of you and me and the American people. It's not about politics. It's not about whether you're for or against the war. It's really just about supporting the warriors themselves. Next time you'll see me, I might be running the New York Marathon. Well, the ride concludes tomorrow in the Hamptons. Well, stay with us. There's much more currents coming up. We'll have the day's headlines, including more support for the National Day of Prayer and an explosive magazine article in Italy gets some fierce reaction in Rome. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Coming up, a lesson in starting over as a Cuban family heads to Spain for a fresh start. But first, let's turn to the day's headlines. Calling the Obama administration's defense of the National Day of Prayer inadequate, more than 30 pro-family organizations want to join in on the case in the U.S. Appeals Court. 
The groups, including Focus on the Family, Liberty Council, and others, filed a motion this week asking the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals to allow them to participate as judges hear oral arguments. In April, U.S. District Judge Barbara Crabb ruled the National Day of Prayer unconstitutional because, she said, it encouraged religious activity. A sign at a Rhode Island high school is at the center of a debate on the separation of church and state. A banner displaying a prayer for the school has been up at Cranston High School West for decades. The prayer begins with the words, Our Heavenly Father, and ends with Amen. But now, as Walt Buteau reports, the American Civil Liberties Union says it's time for it to come down. The prayer's been inside the auditorium as long as anyone can remember. Cranston East graduate Laura Arnett using the track at West can't believe it's all of a sudden an issue. Think if it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. That's what this city tries to do. That's what this state tries to do, getting a little tired of it. If something's worked all that time, nobody's complained, leave it alone. It's come up in other ways. And here the ACLU agrees that if no one complained, it could potentially be left alone. But a Cranston parent did complain. And now Stephen Brown says it's a clear First Amendment violation by the Cranston School District. They represent people of all religions, of no religion, and it's not the business of a school, a public school, to be promoting religion. The school committee will allow public comment on the issue next month and decide what to do. Fighting the ACLU would be expensive, doing nothing potentially unconstitutional in an issue with plenty of opinions on both sides. But if you've made a definitive line about a separation of church and state, you know, we also say the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God. So, you know, I don't know where you draw the line, but clearly there'll always be some people that are happy with it and some people that aren't. School board members say they are considering whether to remove the banner or change its wording. In Italy, the Diocese of Rome today called on priests caught up in a gay sex scandal to step down. The Italian magazine Panorama published an article this week detailing the secret lives of some priests and told the story of a journalist who recorded undercover video of three priests engaged in sexual acts. In a statement, the Rome Diocese called on the clergymen to leave the priesthood and stop sullying the reputation of other ministers. The diocese also blasted Panorama magazine for the article, saying the point of the report was to, quote, create scandal and defame all priests. On Thursday's show, we talked about religious freedom, or the lack thereof, in different parts of the world. But one country we discussed was India, where persecution of Christians is reportedly widespread. Well, despite that disheartening news, vocations to the priesthood in India's north region are on the rise. Indian Bishop Anthony Chereath told reporters recently the region now has 35 priests, up from just three in 1968. Bishop Chereath says many young women are stepping forward to become religious sisters as well. He credits the courage of young people in India for the positive vocation news. Well, parents, if you want to teach your children about the apostles, you now have a new resource featuring a familiar face. The Friends of Jesus is the title of a new children's book that has been published in Italy, and Pope Benedict plays a central role. The writer of the book's prologue says the Pope takes us by the hand and accompanies us as we discover who Jesus' first companions were and why they never abandoned him. The Friends of Jesus is based on Pope Benedict's general audience messages. And finally, if video games are a little more your child's thing, there's some good news there. Bishops in the Philippines launched a video game recently to teach children about the catechism of the Catholic Church. We get a sneak peek at that now from Rome Reports. The bishops of the Philippines have launched a 3D video to teach the faith to youths. Paolo's journey features Paolo, a young boy looking for his way home. By answering questions about the faith, players can keep him safe from falling into fire and help him find keys to pass through caves. It was commissioned by the Episcopal Commission for Catechesis and Catholic Education with the goal of evangelizing youth. The creator, Father Maximo Villanueva Jr. from the Diocese of Balanga in the Philippines based the game on Pope Benedict XVI's Compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The game begins with Paolo running after a lost kitten in the forest. He falls into a well that seems to have no end. He finds himself in a mysterious cave, floating above fire and lava. Paolo begins to cry and a lady angel appears. She says he can escape safely, but he must show his knowledge of the teachings of the church. Players help Paolo by answering questions on the sacraments, the Ten Commandments, and Catholic living.
For every correct answer, a new piece of land pops up, bringing the boy one step closer to finding his kitten and coming home. The priest who designed the game hopes to retell Jesus' story using this alternative means of communication. In 3D and everything. Yeah, that's, that's evangelization cool. if I've ever seen there it. There you go. Right? <laughs> well, stay tuned. There's much more currents coming up. When we return into the deep on immigration. This is an important issue, that it's something that can't wait and should be done in a, in a reasonable way with, with some reasonable policies. Welcome back. On Thursday, July 29th, less than a week from now, Arizona's controversial new immigration law, well, it goes into effect. A federal judge has indicated that some portions of the bill may change, but it will not be completely blocked. As it stands, Arizona's bill would give the police the ability to question someone's immigration status if there's a reasonable suspicion that they may be here illegally. And that's an issue that some fear could lead to profiling. Clearly, this is a volatile issue, and immigration and how to reform it was a topic that we discussed with Bishop DiMarzio back in April. Bishop DiMarzio, thank you so much for being with us again today on Currents. Good. We're talking Good. about immigration reform. Where does it fit into Catholic social teaching? Well, immigration reform is uh, something that we were interested in as Catholics because it fits into how we understand the dignity of the human person. All Catholic social teaching is based on the dignity of the human person, uh, the principle of subsidiarity and solidarity, and all the big words, but basically we're starting with the person. We've got to respect every person. And immigration reform is necessary today because persons are not being respected. Mm. First, we have many, many people in our country that are undocumented, who are working, and again, they're here because they've been drawn by work. And not to give workers their rights and not to regularize them something that goes against human dignity. When we talk about uh, the other issues that affect them, uh, recognizing that every person needs to have some status in a society. Now, unfortunately, many of these people came here without any status. They were drawn by work. And now they have no, no way of accessing the good things of our society. They contribute their work mm -hmm. and they, have, they live in houses and pay rent. Uh, some of them even buy houses. Uh, they contribute, they pay their taxes, co contrary to what the myths around immigration are about. The other, other thing that's a very important with the human dignity is that we have families separated, separated yes. sometimes um, across national boundaries because they can't come, other times because the waiting lines in the, in the legal system are so long. So those are two main concerns we have, workers' rights and uh, family unity are two key things why we are interested in it. Mm. Right, and you've talked about there, you know, some of the ways that the system is broken currently. Uh, what needs to be done, and how do we go about uh, getting it fixed? Well, it's a not it's a not an easy task because first of all, public opinion really dictates quite a bit of how the legislators think about immigration reform. Uh, I, I think, especially in light of the very difficult fight on health care, most legislators would rather not have another fight after this, even though they think it's important. So it's important, again, for Catholics to let the legislators know that they think this is an important issue, that it's something that can't wait and should be done in a, in a reasonable way with, with some reasonable policies. So uh, it's key to, un to understanding uh, uh, we're looking for justice. Uh, there is a Justice for Immigrants program by the, uh, that the U.S. bishops uh, sponsor. And you can have a website, justiceforimmigrants.org. Mm. And this gives you all of the current uh, proposals. It gives you also the opportunity to um, send letters or emails to your legislators. It's very good work, work really uh, putting on your favorites on your computer. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's free and it does keep you updated. So we want people to be involved because only in that way will we get good change. So bookmark that, justiceforimmigrants.org. Right. Okay, we can look at that one. Um, there's also, uh, as far as statistically uh, speaking, 12 million undocumented workers here in the United States. And I was reading, I think it was U.S. Catholic Magazine yesterday, there was an article about immigration reform mm -hmm. in it, and it said it would take 48 years to um, uh, 
make everyone uh, legally documented if that were possible. That yeah. that being said, I don't know if that's true or not per se, but it just seems like it's quite a long time. Well, maybe if everybody was put into a, the legal system and they'd have to wait that amount of time. But we do have what was done in 1986 called legalization, where the people who are here in undocumented status were legalized. Some people confuse that with the word amnesty, which is, uh, raises all kinds of cockles in everybody's uh, yeah. Uh, minds, but it's not really amnesty uh, because legalization is, some, is a process. It's a costly process. It's a process where those who have been uh, working here have to make sure they paid their taxes, put the, uh, their dues in our society. So the legalization system is very important because if we say we have 12 million undocumented people in our country, what kind of national security do we have? Mm. We don't know who they are. Mm. Uh, they've never been counted. Uh, we don't know how they're going to work out in the census. Uh, so really it's important that we regularize uh, the situation and perhaps as some of the proposals now are saying have come up with a, a tamper proof uh, work identity card which is important to yeah. take care of the labor market but also uh, to deal with security issues. Okay. Okay, well, very good. Now, one, one last very quick question here. I mean, we just passed the, the, the health reform bill in through Congress. President Obama signed it. He signed the executive order, as we talked about in our last conversation with you, dealing with the abortion thing. So there's been this big political fight to get that done. Do you think that the political will after this is there to get immigration reform done now? I think only if uh, they hear from the constituents, because it's not going to be easy. And I think, again, there's some battle wounds and scars that are not going to heal very quickly. But I think if there is a groundswell, now uh, several weeks ago there was a, a major rally in Washington, half a million people uh, were down there on a Sunday uh, that were demonstrating for immigration reform. Those are the kind of things I think that speak to the need and also speak to the, the uh, and legislators that this is something that can't wait. Okay. Thank you so much, Bishop Margeo, for being with us talking about immigration reform today. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Definitely a hot topic. Yeah, one of those hot button issues that's gotten hotter, especially after the Arizona law was passed in the subsequent weeks and months now. You know, a, a lot of the, uh, the discussion has centered around that. There are a lot of other states, too, that are considering similar laws, yep. and so it might be something. Of course, a lot of people, I think, though, are waiting to see how this lawsuit is going to turn out in Arizona on that law, and then maybe, you know, framing laws in other states around whatever the outcome is there. And it's a touchy issue. It's a personal issue. But the U.S. was pretty much founded on the principles of immigration. Everybody who's here is not really necessarily from here, except for Native Americans, yeah, right? Right, right? And then um, on, the, on the flip side of it, you look at people who say, well, you know, I'm you know, legal, I have my papers, I was born here, and all of this kind of stuff, and I should have a right to work here, and the people that are working in you know, my place of employment maybe don't have that. They get frustrated, and yet at the same time, you listen to Bishop DiMarzio, and he's talking about the dignity of the human mm -hmm. person, and where does that fall into play? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult situation, but that's, I mean, that's something that really needs to be remembered. We've talked about this before. It kind of is a, almost a catch-all, but it's a very important one, the dignity of the human person and the fact that everyone needs to be Respected. So that's something that has to be front of mind. In fact, and a reminder, you can read more of Bishop DiMarzio's thoughts on this and other subjects in the tablet. Just visit thetablet.org. We'll be right back. Just ahead, another story of migration and starting over in a new land as a family from Cuba gets ready for a new chapter in their lives. as we just heard from Bishop DiMarzio, immigration is really a human rights issue, one involving human dignity, as we just talked about. And the dignity of the person is also at the heart of yet another story now unfolding not far from this country. That's in Cuba. All right. The Catholic Church recently negotiated the release of dozens of imprisoned dissidents in Cuba, and now many families there are about to begin their own kind of immigration, leaving their homeland for what they hope will be a better life. But as CNN Shasta Darlington reports, the wait can be agonizing. Yamilka mm -hmm. is trying to prepare her daughter for their imminent exile from Cuba. Who are we going to see, she asks. Daddy. We're going to get on an airplane, she adds. Mari Carla says she's looking forward to eating apples. 
Her father, Jose Izquierdo, is one of 52 political prisoners that Cuba has agreed to release into exile in a deal with Spain and the Catholic Church. Their family was told to pack their bags more than a week ago, but they're still waiting by the phone in their home about an hour outside Havana. In this suitcase right here, this small suitcase, is everything that Yumilka and her immediate family are taking with them, her two kids, her parents. We've got some clothes, even jackets for the cold weather. They're going to fly from Spain onto Chile. But mostly they have photos. They even have some poems that Izquierdo sent to Yumilka from prison that they hope to, to publish once they get there. But again, a surprisingly small bag carrying everything that they're going to take with them, everything from their life in Cuba. Izquierdo was arrested in 2003 when the government cracked down on opponents it said were in the pay of an enemy government. International pressure to free them grew when one prisoner died earlier this year after an 84-day hunger strike. This month, Raul Castro agreed to the country's biggest release of political prisoners in a decade. More than a dozen dissidents have since been freed from jails and flown to Spain with their families. Izquierdo was supposed to be among them. His family has been told flights are full and to have patience. But in the middle of our visit, Izquierdo calls from the prison to say he's going on a hunger strike until he's released. My husband is free in name, but he's still in prison, Yamilka says. For years, they've been allowed to visit Izquierdo every three months. But they say the wait these days is much harder to bear. So hard to be separated from your family like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we enjoy so much freedom in this country to say generally what we want to say and, and, you know, kind of do what we want to do, the right to free speech and, you know, the right to protest and all of that. So, I mean, to see that, to see your family just torn apart because of this, uh, you know, being imprisoned for, you know, being a, a political prisoner, in other words, is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. It's something that is almost so foreign to us, but then we see it there, and it's so personalized, and it is just heartbreaking. And going back to our immigration story, a lot of families have been torn apart because of the immigration issue, because there are people, parents yeah. that have been deported, right. um, so that they are no longer able to be with their families either. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's sad all around when you are breaking up a family somehow or keeping one apart uh, just because of these kinds of laws or regulations, whether they be domestic or international, yeah. when in fact the thing to keep in mind from the perspective of the Catholic Church, of course, is the dignity, the dignity of the human, of the person, human person like we were talking about before. Exactly, exactly. Well, that is it for tonight. Now, remember, we're always online. We're over at CurrentsNY.net on the World Wide Web, and you can also check us out on Facebook. You sure can. And if you have an idea for a story or you just want to get in touch with us, you can always drop us a line at drop us a line at currentsny.net. That is our email address. Until next time, I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great night and a great weekend.